Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 2.01 and in this lesson we're going to be talking about getting audio to come out of Bitwig Studio and then we'll cover just a few organizational structures within Bitwig that I think may make your lives a little bit easier moving forward. So first and foremost what I've done since the last time we were together I've downloaded all the additional packages that come with Bitwig. So the Essentials Collection and then the Extended Collection, and those all finished. It might take a bit of time, but I was able to get all those in. Uh, for now, we're going to ignore the Partner Collections, but we'll be coming back to that at a pretty soon time in a later video. The next thing I wanna do is, again, free up some space on the screen. It's always good to not have anything open that you don't need. And in our case, we're going to just be focusing on the preferences. So I don't really need our inspector panel. So I can close that down or I can click the I button. Either way, I can also get rid of our browser by clicking the B button or going down here where it says show browser panel. And I can click that and boom, just like that, we've got plenty of screen real estate. So the most important icon of all in Bitwig is this icon up here in the upper left. This is our activate or deactivate the audio engine for our document or for our project. In Bitwig, you're allowed to have multiple projects working at once. Uh, for some reason, that's not working in mine, so I'm not sure what's going on, but in yours, it should work. And you can either click Command N or File New, and so you could potentially be working on five or six different projects all at the same time. However, the caveat to that is that only one of them can have the audio engine going at any given time. So you'll need to go into the project you're working on and activate that audio engine. And even if you're just working in one project like we're working on, we need to make sure that this is lit up and it's orange. So assuming that's the case, we're going to be good to go and we'll be able to hear audio. Assuming a couple of things. One, that we have the proper driver installed. Two, that we're going out of the proper output and three, that we actually have something to listen to. So let's go to our preferences. On the Macintosh, you can get to your preferences by clicking Command and Comma, or you can go to Options and click Preferences, which is what we're going to do. By default, it will open up in general, but for us, we wanna to go to Audio straight away. And on the Mac, you always can just use the Core Audio. That's gonna be perfectly fine. If you're working on a PC though, uh, I would encourage you to use this ASIO for all universal driver uh, for your Windows machine. I won't go into all the details for why you want to use this, but a lot of it has to do with latency and really just working with higher quality audio in general. So head over to this website. I'll link to it in the description and I'll leave it to you guys to do some of that research on your own as to why you want to go with an ASIO driver if you're working on a Windows machine. But back to our preferences here and we've got our core audio set up. My input device by default is going to my built-in microphone, which is perfectly fine. My output device is to my built-in output, which it should be. And my sampling rate right now, we've talked about that a ton, is uh, 48K. And we have a buffer size or really a latency of 256 samples. We'll talk more about that later. So I should have everything here set up properly. And you guys should do the same for right now if you don't have a audio interface hooked in. In the last video, you probably weren't able to hear any sound coming out. And that's because my screen capture software can't capture both the built-in output and the audio interface at the same time. I could do it, but I decided to just kind of keep this simple. So what I'll try to do here is turn up the volume on my computer speakers so that you can hear it coming through the microphone just to prove that it's working. So how can we get some sound in here? Let's do it the easiest way of all. I'm going to double click on our instrument track here. I don't need this audio track. Might as well delete it. You can click it and just select uh, delete. Double click this, that brings up our device panel. And to bring a device into our device panel, I'll just click this plus button and I'll use the polysynth. Now, if you don't have a MIDI controller plugged in and we're going to talk about that quite soon, you can activate a MIDI controller with your actual keyboard by selecting the caps lock button. So I'm going to hit caps lock on my keyboard. 
And now assuming everything is set up correctly, I should be able to play some notes and get some output. Okay, I'm getting output. Let me turn this up. Now, if for any reason my audio engine is deactivated, and hopefully you could hear those notes being played, I'll just I'll clip it just for the sake of it. Let's get it. Let's get it going. So if our audio engine is deactivated and I'm hitting my notes, absolutely nothing is happening right now. Turn the audio engine back on. We're good to go. And similarly, all of the devices are going to be equipped with this same kind of on off button, uh, which I'll just call the device on off button. If I turn this off and I hit notes, we're not going to hear anything, but we're still going to see the MIDI information coming in. If I turn off the entire audio engine, we're not going to even see that we're having MIDI information come in. But I turn that back on, we get the MIDI information, I hit on my synthesizer and we get some sounds coming out. So that's just making sure that you've got everything routed up perfectly. In the next video, we're gonna talk about um, audio interfaces that are separate from your computer. But for now, to make sure you have everything working, those are the things you need to focus on. The next thing I wanted to show you are just a few organizational things and, and tips for working in Bitwig. The first one is if you go to the help and you select this commander here, which I think is also uh, shift enter, or it's like control enter or something. I don't know what that one thing means, but I can <laughs> select this and open it up. I need to learn my key commands, obviously. And um, you can see all of your key commands inside of Bitwig that are working. So this is a very helpful tool if you need to understand and wanna learn the key commands, which I, of course, encourage you guys to do. So this is going to be uh, very, very helpful. And you can even search for what you're looking for in here um, to see. All right, and then to close it down, you're just going to click the close button here. Or actually, I'm sorry, you just have to click outside of the area. Uh, there's a search option in there. And so if I was looking for something like, I don't know, device, toggle the device panel here, you can see just by searching in DEV, it's going to bring this up and it's going to tell me that I can click the D button. Now when I click outside this range, I can click D and it's going to open and close that just like that. The other thing that with Bitwig is very helpful is their user guide. Uh, the user guide isn't necessarily a manual. It was written by Dave Lindenbach, and he's done a lot with like Max for Live. And so he's a very well-known guy in the audio production, musical creation type stuff. And he's done a very good job with this user guide. I actually timed how long it took me to go through the whole thing, which included me jumping into the program. Uh, granted, I have some idea of what I'm doing, but um, I also am a slow reader, and it only took me four hours, three hours and 55 minutes to be a little closer to go through the entire thing. Now, there is a couple frustrating things. One is that we only have access to the user guide from within the program from the help setting. So I can open it up here, but I can't really access it anywhere else for right now. We could do a couple of things. From our preview, we could file and we could save it and we could move it around. But let's dig a little deeper and let's actually find where this is nestled inside of our program. And the reason I want to do this is because sometimes it's helpful to have your user guide just out on the desktop or at another place on your computer so you don't have to have Bitwig open to actually get to it. The other thing is if you have something like a Kindle or you have a... Um, you have another sort of e-reader application, you'll be able to um, very quickly put it onto that without having to try to go through a bunch of steps to figure out where it's located. So if we go to Bitwig Studio here, I can right click this and I'm gonna click show package contents. Be very careful not to mess around too deep in this because you're gonna get in trouble if you do that. And so I can go in here now and I can look at the actual contents. And one thing you're gonna notice right away that's very strange is that there is a folder for VAMP plugins. And we talked about VAMP plugins in an earlier video when we were talking about the Sonic Visualizer. And to me, this is a very good sign 
that we're going to get a lot more visual tools with Bitwig in future releases because they obviously have built into the architecture to allow for the VAMP plugins. I'm too scared to drop a VAMP plugin into the folder. I think it might completely destroy the application, but it is there. Uh, don't don't do it if you're nervous at all. I'm I'm nervous, so I'm not going to do it. But if I go to my resources here, uh, I can find my user guide under documentation. And then here it is, the first thing up here, Bitwig Studio User Guide English. And now I have the ability to obviously copy it and to paste it out to my desktop. It leaves it in the documentation area so I can still open it up when I'm inside of Bitwig, but at the same time I can have access to it here, which is super helpful. You don't need to read the user guide to understand this program, and really we're gonna be covering things more in depth. But if you're moving ahead and moving faster than I'm going, obviously having the user guide might be handy once in a while. It's not going to go into detail on things like synthesis or useful applications to some of their effects, but it is going to talk about how things work inside of Bitwig. So I would recommend taking a look at it if you have the time and if you're interested. The other thing I wanted to show you is with the browser and just how helpful this can be to us and with what we want to do. So let's start with adding a music location. What I've done is I've created a folder on my desktop called Bitwig. And for all of our tutorials and all the work that we're doing together, I'm going to be storing everything inside that folder. But what I can do then is inside of Bitwig kind of route a lot of the panels up here to allow me to access any files within that folder. So we'll start with music locations. Right now I don't have any samples because we're not working with those yet. And I can go into my desktop, go to Bitwig, and I have a folder called Full Tracks. Right now I just have one track in there that we're gonna use pretty soon. I can click Open. It's going to index that below. In this case it went so fast because there's only one track that didn't take any time. And now if I browse over to our music tab inside the browser, we're going to see that folder and that folder was called full tracks. And now if I click it, here's the track inside here. So absolutely perfect, easy. If you're a DJ, you could have a set somewhere and you could link to that set. And then right there, you could have all of your tracks to basically queue up and work with inside of Bitwig. Uh, very brilliant, smart, smart, just great way of doing it. The other thing is with plugins, and I find this to be brilliant. So let me show you guys what I've done here. Inside of my Bitwig folder, I've made a folder called Essential Plugins. And within my Essential Plugins, I'm going to be adding more and more of these folders for things that we're gonna be using and working on together. For a while, we don't really need that much. Uh, you'll see inside my visual, I have the span and the smexoscope. Of course, if you've watched my earlier videos, the smexoscope isn't working. I don't know why, but I hope at a future update they fix that. Uh, that's the one thing I might actually email them about and see if they can get that working. Not the end of the world, uh, because I assume in future releases they're going to be adding a lot of visual tools, but for right now it's kind of frustrating, and I'm shocked that nobody in the beta stage didn't point that out to them, because it is such a popular plugin that people use all the time. So I'll click Open. It's gonna add that to my plugins. So now when I go back to my first panel, the devices and presets, we're going to see that it's added this VST section here. This is the one I just added, and you can see if you follow uh, the file extension that it's going from my desktop to essential plugins. I can open that up, and now look at this. I have folders that I can sort my plugins by, and you could even do this in your regular plugin folder if you wanted to. And I know nowadays things like distortion and saturation becoming huger and huger in the plugin game. And so to just be able to put all of those in one folder without having to scroll through all the brands and all the companies would make your life very, very easy. So in this case, I can click visual, open it up, and just like that, I have the span. Now you're wondering, why is there nothing down here? Well, the reason is because I don't have any presets saved for the span yet. And Bitwig works with plugins very differently. It uses its own engine to run the plugins, meaning if a plugin crashes, it won't crash the host. So it won't crash Bitwig. But what that also means is that we can do a lot of stuff with the plugins kind of 
um, independently. So let me bring the span onto our instrument track here. And I'll just leave it as it is for right now. But what I want to do is I'm going to open this up and I'm going to click save and I'm going to call this default Brian. I have the ability to also categorize this. Let's see, is there something I could ever use? Let's call it, mm, mm, I don't know why this is that important. This is just an example. I'll call it mastering and I'll put on, I don't know. This is again, just an example. I'll put harmonic because in a way that's what it is measuring. It's measuring harmonic content across the frequency spectrum. So I'll click okay. And now if I'm going through and I'm looking for my plugins within each plugin, I'm going to have access to my presets, which is huge. So it saves everything that I've done with that plugin inside its own little shell here. And that means that when we do things and we design certain instruments and presets, and they're really, really complicated because I could add more to this than just that one plugin. There's a whole lot of things I could drop in here as well if I wanted to. And we're going to have all of that for us in this bottom section right here. And notice as well that I've tagged this as harmonic, which means if I get out of this folder and I just click Bitwig devices in general, I might actually have to click on here to get to it. But if I search for harmonic right off the bat, this is going to be frustrating. What else? What, is, what did I call that? I think I called it like Brian. Let's see if we, let's see if we can get it up. Uh, but in essence, what you can do is you can use those meta metadata to make searching for things very, very easy. I'm sorry that I can't get the example to work right off the bat here, but um, it would work assuming that you are searching the right way. But if I was just searching for something, like I wanted to find sounds that were bright. Okay, I'm going to click within Bitwig devices. Now I'm going to search for bright. And now it's giving me all the folders where there are presets that have been tagged with that particular tag, the tag of bright. So let's look inside our polysynth. And now all of these presets have been tagged with bright. And you can see that down there very, very easily. So if I wanted to, though, I could open this up. I could edit the file metadata and then say, you know what? It actually isn't bright. And I could take that off, click OK, um, and then it would probably go away. I'm not sure if you can actually edit the metadata from some of their built-in stuff, but that is the uh, basics of this browser and of the file structure uh, from the most sort of macro to the most micro of level. All right, I hope that's helped you guys out a little bit. I uh, just thought it would be cool to show you some organizational stuff first and, and how I'm going to be doing it as I move forward to make my life a little bit easier. And hopefully some of those little tips and tricks will make your life easier as well. Thanks for watching.